Hey guys, my name is Gary Chait and this is Jason Peckham. We are prop traders in Victor's Capital. We just want to welcome you to the Victor's Podcast, which will just be a series of conversations with interesting people and different crypto experts around the industry. Uh, today we're going to have a chat with Paolo Aduano and we're going to talk about Tether, Bitfinex matching engines and even a little bit about Crypto Rocks. Thank you and I hope you enjoy it. Hey Paolo, how are you doing? Um, I am Gary Chait and this is my colleague Jason. We come in live from Invictus Capital in the southern tip of Africa. Thanks for having us. It's probably our first podcast we're doing, so I hope you have a bit of patience. Would you mind giving us a, a five minute intro, just uh, who you are, what you do, how you got there, and uh, let's kick it off like that. First of all, thank you very much for having me today. So, um, also, I'm not really well used to podcasts, so. <laughs> I, I appreciate your patience as well. So, uh, I'm Paolo Doino. I'm um, CTO at Bitfinex and Tether. Um, I started my journey in, uh, you know, as a coder when I was like eight, nine years old in my hometown, a really small town in, in Italy. There was nothing to do for me apart coding. All my friends were far away, so I, I could only just uh, play with a computer all day. Um, so I wanted to start uh, creating my own games and and uh, and so on. So I started doing that, and then um, you know started uh, with uh, with the internet. I started learning more and more, and then I went to the university in uh, in Genoa, where I graduated in computer science, and then I became a researcher for the university. And uh, I was there involved in one of my preferred um, jobs of all time. That was. Um, researcher in a military field for, for um, higher resiliency uh, telecommunications in, uh, in battlefields. And then uh, after that, I decided that it was not really well paid. So I moved to first Switzerland to learn about finance, uh, working with some um, hedge funds. And then I decided that what I, was, I, I built for them a portfolio management system for their clients. And then I decided that I could make it in a company and then uh, Twin Cluster was born in London in 2013. Was like was a um, company that was servicing uh, big hedge funds in the city. Um, that where they had to reconcile positions and uh, you know data from uh, tens of different um, uh, trading venues. And um, you know I I was spending all my day apart from building the platform. Really, the most challenging part was. Uh, actually building or reconciling all these information that were really dirty from, uh, you know, different parties, right? They were full of holes, they were missing sometimes, and then they were using SFTP, and it was super, super annoying um, because, you know, it's, data should be clean, right? Data should be clean, consistent, and so on, right? At that time, I was in 2013, I was reading about Bitcoin, and I was, I was thinking, even before thinking, okay, this is an amazing currency, it will solve all the problems of the world, I, I, I was thinking, okay, blockchain as an underlying technology would solve all my problems, would, you know, make data consistent, uh, highly available, uh, I could go back in history, I could, you know, do everything that was wasting so much of my time and my team's time um, in a really simple, uh, in a really simple way. So I was fa um, fascinated by, by, by that. Um, and, uh, then of course it drew in me also the concept of Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency and as a way to, uh, you know, keep control of your own wealth, because I believe that is one of the most important parts of, uh, you know, our modern finance. So giving people the uh, freedom of and control over over of, over their own funds. So, a long story short, in 2014, I met Giancarlo, current um, uh, Tether and Bitfinex CFO, and he was saying he asked me to help the team as a part-time developer because Bitfinex was quite already an important trading platform back in in, in, day, in 2014. It was only uh, one of the probably two or three platforms that were offering margin trading. And, uh, you know, margin trading is, is great because you can go, you can use a little bit of uh, leverage. Uh, at the same time, it also requires uh, high, a higher level of performance because you have to also to handle liquidation. Because when you, when, um, you have a lot of traders that take for the leverage positions, you have to dollarize their collateral. And then because you need to make sure that you can 
handle liquidation properly properly at the right time because otherwise either you liquidate they 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 lose too much or the company risks to lose uh funds right in in the process so my job as uh, you know expert in um, you know, parallel computing and high available applications um and uh, you know w- was to build a new matching engine so i joined big things um focusing on the matching engine first uh, at that time, the machine engine was doing like 50 orders per second. It was uh, database based, right? It was based on MySQL. That's for a machine engine. Really, it, it's not the way you would like to design it because machine engine should be, you know, sub millisecond performance when it comes to order matching and you know, um, full round of trip. So um, we were looking to integrate with external machine engines like you know off the shelf machine engines, and then. Uh, I, I decided to, well, it was proven quite hard given the complexity of the platform already and all the margin system that we had. So I proposed to the team to give me the chance to try and improve the matching engine. So um, in a few months, we moved from 50 orders per second to, you know, um, 50,000, well, in, in one year. But then from 50 to 1,000, 10,000, then 50,000. Uh, at that time, I decided that also it, when I joined, uh, Bitfinex interface was refreshing the order book uh, first up every 30 seconds and then up every five seconds. That seems like an eternity now. Um, and that was uh, still around 2014, beginning 2016. So another thing that, um, that I was uh, started working on uh, quite soon after I joined was uh, uh, the WebSocket order book and the WebSocket stream that I believe that uh, still today, um, uh, between us has one of the most sophisticated uh, WebSocket uh, and streaming based APIs. Um, so in 2016, I became uh, CTO uh, after the half. Um, it was really, uh, let's say, interesting moment. I was, uh, uh, I got the chance to be key part of, uh, I believe, one of the most outstanding teams in, in, the, in, uh, in the cryptocurrency uh, world, and I got the chance to lead the development team of, of, that, uh, of this company. And in 2017, I was offered the same um, position for Tether um, to, over, uh, to overview the security aspects and uh, you know, the, the, the technological processes of Tether as well. Well, thanks for the thorough introduction, Paolo. Um, so yeah, you mentioned that uh, Bitcoin was like your your major entry into cryptocurrency, and um, for me, like as a trader on your exchange and just keeping an eye on what other exchanges are doing, it seems that Bitcoin is remaining very core to uh, to Bitfinex's offering. And uh, I actually saw yesterday that there's been a, a 210 million round uh, raised by Blockstream, a Series B. Um, so yeah, I'd just be interested to hear from your perspective, like where where you see this going and and what you're most excited about in the um, Bitcoin sidechain space. I'm really lucky uh, because in my position, I can I work for two companies that were uh, extremely successful, thanks in my opinion to Bitcoin. So in my position, I can I I can actually give back to Bitcoin and the entire crypto industry. And you know, as you mentioned, uh, the investment in Blockstream is actually um, our way to to get back to that uh, to this industry, right? So I believe that Blockstream is one of those companies that are extremely critical and important to the entire crypto world. So um, us investing and participating in the round that, uh, that will help uh, Blockstream to further grow, work keep working on Liquid, Lightning Network, and mining will definitely. Um, uh, I believe uh, help ensuring the, that uh, the, the the ecosystem will have the proper funding to keep growing and to keep uh, you know growing the number of application number of uh, solutions that will allow Bitcoin to scale right and to remain uh, solid uh, solid as it, is, as it is today. So what I love I love about Blockstream is that they are focusing a lot of mining recently and Liquidity is uh, a proper sidechain for Bitcoin. And they are they are spending a lot of time in trying with on C Lightning that should also in the future have to my understanding will have also support for um, liquid assets. So you have you will have a version of liquid that will support uh, you know uh, Bitcoin on liquid, but also at the same time USDT and all the other assets that are issued on on liquid. So that's quite exciting. 
also because I believe that the Lightning Network is one of those technologies that, or is the actual way to scale blockchains, right? Is, is, um, is not trying, a Lightning Network is a different approach from what you are seeing usually when you try to scale blockchains. It's not an, a blockchain on top, on top of a blockchain, but it's actually a peer-to-peer -peer system on top of a blockchain where you know, we, um, all the participants that want to send funds to each other are actually almost connected either directly to each other or through a couple of routine hops, like uh, you can imagine the Tor network. And that is actually, so uh, there is no, you know, central blockchain that will collect uh, all those uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, Lightning Network transactions per, per second, hopefully in the future, right? Now our Still a small, a small number, but in the future, that's the only way to scale, right? Um, having a peer-to-peer, -peer, a direct connection between people that want to pay or get paid uh, with or from each other, so 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 that you don't pollute everyone else with your data. If the data remains contained and confined to the people that really need that data, and it's actually the only way to scale to millions of transactions per day. And I believe that if we are in, in the business and in industry that tries to bring actual micropayments to the world, that is the only or the, that is the right way to do it. Okay, wow, really interesting. Paolo, just one question as a trader, right, um, relating to Tether. We're all on these like Twitter networks and Discord channels following well alerts and every now and then you'll see a huge transaction and then a few minutes later you'd see you correcting them saying, oh, it's actually a chain swap. And I think me explaining that to a lot of traders are saying, just relax, it's actually a chain swap, it's not Tether being printed or this and that. No one really sort of understands what it is, why it's done, how you perhaps identify it without you notifying us. Um, could you just share some light on that and just give us a, a bit of a rundown on chain swaps and, and how you do it, et cetera? Sure. Um, so um, chain swaps are uh, a way to rebalance how many tethers are on the different uh, blockchains, right? So you can imagine that uh, as an exchange, for example, you have seen recently, uh, I would say it was uh, yesterday, uh, there was a huge chain swap for two billion. Uh, the chain swap was now that it's public because it's tracked on blockchain, uh, you can see that chain swap was made with Binance. So what happens is that basically Binance have uh, a lot of, uh, ended up having a lot of uh, TRC20, so Tron tethers, and uh, while their customers were interested uh, uh, over time, we draw more and more um, ERC20, so Ethereum tethers. So, uh, you know, uh, after a while, um, what happens, since uh, in, in the accounting of uh, an exchange, all tethers are all equal one tether is one tether independently on the blockchain, you have many, many, many users depositing Tron tethers and withdrawing Ethereum tethers. At a certain point, you end up not being able to fulfill additional Ethereum tether um, withdrawals until there is a chain swap. So a chain swap is basically uh, Binance raising the hand and coming to tether and saying, guys, I have too uh, many Tron tethers, but I don't have any more Ethereum tether. Can I send you some some uh, Tron tether back so that you can give me, you can swap those for some Ethereum tether? And that is exactly how a chain swap works, right? So of course, if the process is a little bit more complicated than that, because of course, with this size of money, you know, it, uh, there is a lot of conversation going on, a lot of chats, many people signing off and so on. Uh, but that is basically how it happens on, and the reason why it happens. So um, also uh, on the smaller side, as you can see that, uh, you know, BitPX uh, does the um, uh, same. For example, BitPX is heavily used by other exchanges to send uh, uh, Tether on other blockchains and uh, swap with other blockchains again, right? Because um, Tether is, is the only exchange that supports all the current eight blockchains that are supported by Tether. And so it's easy for other exchanges to integrate uh, BitConnect into the flow so that you can easily swap one chain to another and rebalance the internal uh, books for, for 
uh, for the data blockchains that they support. Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah, I guess that that's something I've been wanting to ask for a while. So yeah, Pablo. So we've been uh, trading on the spot books on Bitfinex, and one thing we've realized recently is that um, Bitfinex has, of course, always been a very dominant spot player, and uh, we're interested on um, in terms of like what you've seen with Bitfinex gaining market share and. Uh, Recently, when we had the bottom at about $30,000, it seemed to be a pattern of uh, spot accumulation as opposed to the more derivatives-led markets that um, were, were uh, seen in the previous run-up. So um, my question to you is how you see this uh, market structure differently and uh, what do you think that might mean for the market going forward? Um, Bitfinex has been always, I would say, king of liquidity when it comes to the major pairs, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum, and you know, the major major cryptocurrencies. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum specifically, we, um, you know, with um, with the story, long story of um, uh, of Bitfinex, Bitfinex had uh, accrued over time the trust of uh, a lot of big funds and, and whales, right? So you could have, you could mm, when you mentioned the the Mm, bottom at 30k, and it definitely you you have noticed the uh, that we had some um, big position being built and uh, you know um, and uh, uh, managed and adjusted over a matter of few days without moving really much the price thanks to thanks to um, Bitcoin as liquidity. But we have um, accounts that are enormous, uh, I would say, and uh, you know you can see also from our cold wallet. So we have those type of traders and uh, and hedge funds that have you know uh, billions under management that uh, that uh, uh, are not high frequency traders traders but actually they use Bitfinex and as their main um, exchange and they periodically they rebalance their portfolio and they trade on Bitfinex because they they like the fact that they can actually you know buy or sell twenty thousand Bitcoin without moving the price up or down five thousand dollars so. Uh, th- that is um, that is something that we get uh, a lot of praise for. And uh, uh, if you add that to you know high frequency traders or market makers or group IQ that can provide that liquidity and high frequency form, that we we have the best mix, right? You, we have big whales with big portfolios that you know put the pressure on the market, uh, but they don't want actually to move the market. And guys like you that step in and keep keeping these these these, um, these traders that uh, would, and providing them uh, liquidity. So it's the perfect mix. Um, and uh, of course, we are also recently ramping up on the retail side that uh, that also give another source of uh, you know uh, liquidity to the to our markets. Okay, cool. Um, Paolo, one thing that's uh, it's pretty much uh, growing at a rapid rate is um, with regards to the future of exchanges is you'll have a decentralized exchange and a centralized exchange. And just for me personally and for everyone, I, I really know personally, most people prefer trading on a centralized exchange. Just the user experience and everything is just, it's quite a lot easier. So aside from like maybe KYC purposes or anything else, do you think in the future people would prefer to trade on a decentralized exchange or do you think going into the future centralized exchanges still will have the upper hand in the market share? So I think that, uh, you know, is that recently um, there was a lot of talk about uh, DeFi, the future of DeFi due to um, uh, regulatory um, uh, regulators stepping in or taking a deeper look into, De- uh, into DeFi and uh, decentralized exchanges. As well, you know, that also was part of the whole discussion in, uh, regarding the infrastructure bill. So um, I think that um, eventually, at least from this is what I gather from our compliance officer, um, that is, uh, you know, a, a person that is deeply involved in discussions with regulators. It's also a former um, um, uh, Bank of Montreal and uh, is uh, super knowledgeable. His, um, his, um, his point is that eventually it, we cannot expect uh, decentralized exchanges to continue in this way, uh, independently from what you think, right? That uh, independently of, uh, you know, the level of privacy and freedom that you are attached to or what you personally think um, uh, in terms of, you know, freedom of choice, freedom of uh, being, the remaining private and so on. Uh, it, it's clear that, you know, the, there is a, Big push from uh, regulators 
in trying to get a way into a way to regulate um, uh, decentralized exchanges. And, uh, you know, the easiest step is trying to bring KYC to decentralized exchanges, right? So, because in my opinion, decentralized exchanges have two big winning points now uh, in the eyes of, uh, of consumers. One is super easy entry point with no KYC. And second is uh, um, uh, not having to trust uh, uh, centralized uh, parties to keep their funds safe, right? So, so basically you can say that the two advantages in terms of fast adoption and growth of uh, decentralized exchanges are no KYC and, um, and non-custodial, right? So when it comes to no KYC, as, as I said, I don't think it will last forever. Um, um, and when it comes to non-custodial, that is um, definitely something that centralized exchanges could be doing a little bit more um, on, on that front. So you can actually implement a non-custodial uh, trading still via centralized machine engine. We at Bitfinex proved the concept with Adfinex first and Yieldfinex that we're actually allowing users to keep their funds on a, on a blockchain, but then um, uh, signing uh, uh, cryptographically with their private key, the order metadata in order for us then to broadcast the, the trade on the blockchain and that's all via smartphone. Again, um, I think that the, you still, in that way, you still offer a, um, a real time, a really high frequency oriented you know, uh, performance to retail and professional traders while removing the problem of uh, non custodial, of a non custody. Then, uh, oh, oh, sorry, removing the problem of custody. Now, um, of course, we have seen, and Tether has been, you know, participants of, uh, of, uh, and a solution to, to these problems, uh, even recently. We have seen that, uh, you know, DeFi is not, uh, always, um, the safest place in the world because we have seen poly networks that have been hacked for $600 million and actually Tether uh, has stepped been to, uh, to, to save, uh, $33 million dollars worth of USDT, right? So, I think that, uh, you know, DeFi or CFI, uh, they have pros and cons. I believe that eventually the pros and cons will, uh, will, there will be, um, there will be probably, um, DeFi will, will have part of their pros, uh, um, uh, diminished or, or, you know, um, removed by, um, regulatory intervention. As well as uh, C5, so centralized exchanges, will try to improve their technology or will try to look on how to integrate um, the good aspects or the, you know, the more appealing aspects of DeFi into a centralized uh, platform. Because actually, in my opinion, uh, matching can happen centrally again without, um, without the need of being handled by a blockchain. Because uh, we have seen blockchains that tend to, you know, claim really huge numbers in terms of of uh, of mesh of of speed and uh, smart contract uh, execution speed, but the problem is actually that, uh, you know, even if you can handle 10,000, 50,000 um, transactions per second on a blockchain, that is not enough because just the finish and peak times maybe handle 100,000 orders per second. So and. Uh, so if you are, you know, if uh, you want to service the many different changes that want to use your blockchain as uh, as a, as an order book, then you know you you will definitely can will not be able to cope. So the only way to cope is uh, seeing transa on chain transaction fees uh, spiking up, right? And again, that will act as uh, will end up in exactly what is happening with Ethereum now. So I believe that the best of the two worlds is having C5, for example, matching and uh, and um, non-custodial using blockchains only for trade settlement. Yeah, I appreciate the the technical insight on on exactly where centralized exchanges can offer that that matching engine throughput, and then you can also potentially tie in the benefit of DeFi where where you have that non-custodial aspect. And one thing I do enjoy about about uh, Bitfinex, especially on your data streams, is that you. Um, publicize, for example, the the amount of outstanding uh, BTC USD longs and shorts, and uh, I think it was from about mid June until late June. It it was like really at the forefront of uh, crypto Twitter. There was a massive short that was put on. I think it was about twenty five thousand Bitcoin, um, and it was closed about thirty percent lower. 
Um, I, I was just interested at the time whether it was like a potentially a market neutral position, which uh, Gaudi mentioned to me that that uh, he was looking at data mission, thought that it was unlikely to be market neutral. But I was just wondering um, how you at Bitfinex uh, view that sort of activity. And uh, obviously, you don't know exactly who's putting it on or whatever. Um, but uh, just exactly how, how those sorts of major moves go on. So uh, that, that uh, really taps into what um, I was uh, mentioning um, before in terms of uh, having these uh, huge funds and, and whales that are you know, managing and readjusting their positions periodically. And um, um, of course, these, uh, these customers are, um, are, you know, are, all these connects are able to open these uh, massive uh, longs or shorts with, uh, with little friction. So, well, first, the only thing that I can say, because of course I cannot reveal any, any particulars of the, you know, the, the funds that, uh, that are involved in such operations, is that of course, as an exchange, we love that type of action because uh, it definitely brings us uh, more whales as well as market makers that will see because uh, BigPhoenix is again having this deep liquidity allows um, not allows um, big users to move to uh, accumulate or reduce positions with really little friction and without moving the market. But that is also thanks to market makers that are keep putting and more and more liquidity depositing. Uh, hedging their positions maybe somewhere else on, on our perpetuals and so on, right? So, uh, and I believe that's one of the reasons why we are able to do that with the so big, uh, so much of the big sizes of positions is also the, our, um, the, our ability to handle so many orders per second because we, we, we were seeing during that time, we were seeing market makers sending hundreds of orders per second to keep eating and eating those massive positions that were being built, right? Because they were eating those positions on our side and they were edging on uh, maybe on another change on our curves and so on. So you can, I believe that, um, if, I believe that the only word that I can use to describe that type of action on Bitcoin X during these days is, is beautiful because it, you can see the markets that are moving like a, uh, like a genuine organic creature and you know you you can and as you said as you mentioned you can see all, all the data is public right so uh, the data of long short how much is being borrowed lent and and so on is, is public so you can formulate your opinion your idea you can try to understand what's going on you can see the volume and so on and uh, from from uh, you know running the, from the person that is running the exchange point of view is that that is just beautiful yes that's very true. Um, well, another thing that's pretty much quoted a lot in trading groups and, and just guys always curious on is sort of the stock that an exchange holds at any one time. You know, everyone's like, oh, there could be a, a Bitcoin shortage on this exchange. And recently we read that Coinbase added an extra half a billion of, uh, of crypto liquidity just to their, to their stock. Is that something running an exchange that's really difficult to manage? And, and how do you guys take a view on how much stock an exchange must have at any one point just to meet the sort of demand that could come in at any point? Well, um, let's, let's uh, split the things in, uh, in two, right? One is, um, so an exchange has always to be um, completely uh, uh, backed, right? So Bitcoin has all the Bitcoins that have been deposited on the exchange by spot traders, plus all the Bitcoins that are built on a margin position, on margin long position, minus all the Bitcoin that have been shorted, right? So, our accounting system is, uh, you know, quite easy from a certain point of view. Um, from another point of view, might be a little bit tricky to understand. But you can imagine that, you know, we have always to have all the different cryptocurrencies and fiat that have been deposited at any point in time by the user, right? So that, um, and also when it comes to the the other side of things, is that of course you want also to give uh, to have traders that. Um, that are piling up a ton of liquidity into the books, right? So you have to give them, uh, um, you know, a really good set of APIs and really good, you know, infrastructure and so on, so that they can, they feel, and also um, um, pleasing them with, uh, you know, your security measures in order that, you know, they have to be comfortable in keeping with you tens of millions of dollars. So our secret sauce, I would say, is that, right, having a way for them to, 
know that when the market starts, they can start to, you know, piling up tons of orders and, you know, with the, within, within a second. At the same time, it, you know, um, um, a lot of different security measures. Um, and, uh, and also, of course, one, uh, one of the things that Sixfinex is great on, uh, is, is security, right? So we, you can, you, you might have seen our cold wallet in Bitcoin growing like crazy in the last uh, six months, uh, passing from uh, 190,000 Bitcoin to 180, up to a top of 210,000 um, in uh, one month ago, uh, Bitcoin. Okay, cool. Yeah. So in terms of those uh, margin positions, uh, we've at Invictus Capital, we've got a margin lending fund that's, that uh, historically has done the majority of its uh, lending activities on Bitfinex. And one thing that's um, unique about your system is that it's uh, peer-to-peer and also allows for bots to be set up and and to to lend on on the exchange. But uh, what's interesting now is that the the ecosystem seems to have attracted a lot of a lot more capital that that's going after this sort of market neutral and uh, less risky yield. So I was just interested um, as to how how you see um, that sort of different market structure and how. Um, even though we're at much higher level, um, the the interest rates on, for example, the USD lending are still so subdued. So um, I think that uh, we are in a particular moment in time where markets uh, are, um, you know, different from a few months ago. Right, a few months ago, there everyone and their sisters were entering Bitcoin, so you could see. So much pressure on on the Bitcoin side, and of course that was resulting in enormous interest in borrowing USDT. Um, and the reason why uh, borrowing USDT was um, was uh, extremely important and uh, and popular, it is still today. But you know, a few months ago we were we had all the Tesla um, discussions and MicroStrategy was starting announcing all these uh, enormous uh, investments in. Uh, in, uh, in Bitcoin and, you know, plant, uh, really every big uh, institution, or well, not every, but a lot of big institutions were really jumping to the market. And so in, in, in uh, margin trading, so you, you are trading a pair, right? So it means that you are going long BTC USDT. It means that you are going long BTC and you are going short USDT. It means that if you are going short USDT, you are selling, you know, something that you don't have, so you have to borrow. So if you have to borrow USDT and the more, the more massive becomes the BTC market, of course, there is more pressure on the borrowing. There is more pressure on the Bitcoin upside, but also there is a pressure on the borrowing in USDT. And that is one of the reasons why actually Tether drew from, uh, you know, 4 billion in uh, early 2020 to uh, 65 billion as today on, um, um, and the reason is that, you know, there is a, there was um, the majority of the, the crypto changes um, that offer derivatives after after big mess really were all USDT uh, settled, right? So cash settled, but in USDT, and that of course were um, putting a lot of um, um, interest in from different groups to borrow more or not sorry borrow to buy more and more um, USDT. We have seen, you know, major exchanges, major um, um, OTC that uh, major um, trading firms really uh, stepping in and buy tons of USDT uh, from Tether.io in order to, you know, um, use that as a, you know, for for trading derivatives, but also for spot trading. All the biggest uh, trading markets uh, are at both on spot and perps are now USDT uh, based. Sorry, if I can add one more thing. Um, and recently, now we are, so you started with a question. So why the, the interest rates are, are lower now? And the reason is that we are, I believe in this moment, there is a little bit uncertainty. Yes, the price approached 50K or past 50K, but the volumes are not the volumes that were three months ago. So uh, I would say that, you know, of course, um, the market moved, the move half, and again, when the market is moving up, there is more demand also for for Tether because again, all the biggest markets are uh, are USDT based. So from uh, since last uh, the, the beginning of uh, August, Tether issued three billion dollars. But um, you know, it's not uh, again the the volume and the market uncertainty 
is uh, completely um, is really I believe, believe driving the, um, the interest down. Uh, not um, and um, you know I, I believe that as soon as there is another big momentum, you will see the interest uh, going up a lot because. I believe we are seeing many whales, many hedge funds are waiting on the sidelines now. Yeah, it's quite a good sign seeing we, we've rebounded quite well and that demand isn't like frothy like it was before. Sort of gives you hope there could be a, a bigger rally soon. But um, just wanted to touch on something. Uh, seeing as you had to build matching engines and quite complex work in the back end of Bitfinex, um, a bit of a fun question. I don't know if it is possible, but seeing as now that someone would spend like 400 ETH on a crypto rock, um, could we see a future, right, where someone could deposit that NFT as collateral? Because, I mean, he's sitting on a, let's say, hypothetically, a million dollar asset. Would he be able to trade using that as margin in the future? And uh, do you think that's actually possible? So, um, so that's a really good question. So my go-to answer would be, well, that's kind of crazy because, uh, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's uh, really, I mean, there is no liquid market, right? The, if you if you are as an exchange, if you are allowing a certain cryptocurrency or a certain currency or a certain asset as collateral, it means that that asset needs to be liquid, right? Because you have to keep repricing that asset at the current market value. But what is the market value of a rock when you know one day is ten thousand dollars, one other another day is fifty thousand, one hundred, five hundred thousand, maybe it will be five dollars eventually. So as an exchange, you would need to eat the risk. So I believe that you know um, the only way an exchange could do that, for example, is to have an air type, right? On Bitfinex, when we allow on certain particular assets, especially you know, some some assets that have a history of uh, volatility. Uh, extreme volatility, we have something called haircut. So basically, we apply a certain uh, percentage discount to the collateral, um, um, to how much collateral actually that asset can, uh, can provision to your account. So you could imagine that maybe, you know, you can apply a 90% uh, haircut on, on an asset like, uh, like an NFT in this moment. Yeah, I guess so. That it, it, it... I, you sort of, I think Aave were trying to do it where they were like almost letting you borrow against them in some way. Uh, but yeah, it's a tricky one, but I could definitely see someone trying it at some point in the future. That's yeah. perhaps, uh, perhaps a case where a, a decentralized uh, protocol could at least test the waters and probably get it wrong a couple of times before someone with the reputation of Bitfinex um, potentially brings it to a bigger <laughs> market. You never know. It seems these guys are trading crypto rocks and punks have got a lot of collateral. So maybe when that whole space cools down, they'll be looking to to get into some longer term spot or margin positions. Yeah, we'll have to see. You would need basically to have uh, public oracles and, you know, from, uh, let's say that you have uh, probably, you know, if you have uh, a a watch, well, then you cannot have a watch, but you have a, like a picture that is actually auctioned by um, by Sotheby's or some big uh, brand, right? They they could be your oracle for the pricing of that, that such thing, and they can also they are the ones that are putting a stamp of approval. So for certain assets, you could argue that you can actually do that. But you know, with the ton of NFTs that are now on the market, right? You that are created by by really young kids. I mean, um, it, it it might be fun, but I wouldn't have those uh, other than collateral to be finished by any time soon. Yeah, okay. Cool. Maybe instead of the, the discount, you could use the floor price and get some sort of buyer of last resort so that you know you could offload them and not take the risk <laughs> on as an exchange yourself. Yeah. You can you can sell the position. You know, sometimes you can say you can auction a position, and I wonder if you could build a system that automatically, well, we are thinking to uh, build a system that actually that automatically auction a position instead of liquidating the market you could actually auction it to other players and by, by also but in that case you have to tell them which type of collateral you, you, you assign to the position right so it would be fun to see if you are auctioning something that has a rock as a collateral and is like a, a BTC short I, I can already see traders scratching their head and say, what the hell is going on here? 
<laughs> I could definitely see that in the future, though. Yeah, I, and I guess, uh, Paolo, just to sort of uh, wrap up and uh, and finish it off, uh, I don't know if you want to share with us any futures, your future vision you have for the for the exchange and Phoenix, and what you sort of see crypto looking like at the end of next year, or even at the end of this year. I mean, it's changed so much every week. You always have to keep your finger on the pulse. So it's a difficult question, but. Maybe just to end off on that note, if you can. Yeah, I think that uh, there is. Um, I think that uh, the future of CFI and DeFi will see more and more uh, investment in uh, licensing, uh, you know, legal KYC and stuff. Because you know, we are we grew from uh, this industry from uh, from nothing to something that is uh, becoming mainstream or already became mainstream. So I think that the next step for for Bitcoin, as I hinted many times publicly, and now we are streaming close is uh, really to jump on uh, security trading in a in a different way than what we might have uh, seen from other changes uh, doing it right so we are less interested in uh, having you know, Google or Apple being traded on Bitfinex rather than we are more interested in offering a platform for uh, for um, STOs so security token offering things like that and we are extremely close so Keep an eye on our Twitter feed. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Good advice. Thanks. We'll do it. Listen, thanks so much uh, for being our first guest on our podcast. It was, it was a cool experience for us, and we definitely learned a lot. And uh, hopefully we can chat sometime soon in the future. Of course. And, well, first of all, is again, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having had me today. And, uh, you know, um, thank you for trading a bit. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Anytime. All right. Cheers, Paolo. Cheers, Paolo. Cheers. Thanks, Paolo. That was really great. We really enjoyed it. And uh, I hope everyone else did too. If you like the podcast, then make sure to hit the like and subscribe button and leave us a comment below. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.